Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. And today we're going to be talking about something that I think is completely underutilized as an entrepreneur, and that is partnerships. And, you know, many of us have heard the, you know, the word JV partners and all this. But today we're going to go into a deep exploration of what true partnership means and how do you use it to build your business. I'm excited. I want to welcome Joey to the show. He's a highly sought after omni channel marketing consultant with over 14 plus years of experience managing industry leading health and wellness brands, helping his clients generate over $100 million in combined sales. Yes, that's 100 with the M million. Joey's a specialist in creating systems for scale, a savvy marketer, and an entrepreneur with a no BS approach to life and business. He's helped scale an e-commerce business and doubled revenue for partnerships for six years straight while earning six ClickBank Platinum Awards and helping his company earn Inc. 5000 status and becoming the third fastest growing supplement company in the USA. Welcome to the show, Joey. Thank you, Kim, and thank you for that introduction. Appreciate it. Gee, it was so well written. It was easy for me to say. <laughs> a lot of that might not be anything that anyone understands as far as ClickBank and stuff, but happy to jump into anything that uh, you want to pick through. So first of all, I'm just going to ask you sort of the obvious question, and because I think people have a, a misconception. Can you use partnerships to build your business? Absolutely. It's the only way that I know how to build a business and people who are neglecting it are leaving a lot of money on the table. And most people just don't give it the respect that it deserves because there's also some people that think it's an MLM or it's some sort of scammy thing that people don't offer or shouldn't offer through a business. And it's the exact opposite. I look at partnerships as an extension of your team, somebody speaking on your behalf when you're not in the room. I like it. I like it. You know, something I was thinking about is some of the partnerships that I've had, and I didn't even realize they were partnerships at the time. They just kind of happened and they were so beneficial. Like I have partnerships with some of my clients. Um, you know, I partner with them to help them build their business. I'm always available for them even after they've launched their books. You know, we have discussions. I, I check in with them on a regular basis. But, you know, for them, part of the partnership, and it's not official and it's it's not anything like that, but they see me as a partner. And because they see me as a partner, they refer me business. And to be honest, you know, the referrals that I get, I close nine out of 10. So that is a, a partnership where I invest in them and they in return and appreciation invest back into my company. And that's what you want. <laughs> that's a beautiful way of saying exactly what, you know, one of the issues that people experience is they're, it's kind of like sales, you know, they don't want to ask for the referral, they, they don't want to make it a commission based transactional thing. But I think if you take the stigma out of that, um, people expect those partnerships to manifest. And it's okay. And I think that not being clear with the ask, not being clear with the compensation model is, and the promise and the overall structure of how your affiliate program should work. And if you don't know how to do that, you know, there's multiple ways I can walk through on that, but really just being clear upfront what the expectation is. So if I'm releasing a book, it's like, what am I going to pay down commissions on the front end, on the back end? And who are my partners? Who are the people that I can bring as a partnership? And then you start there, but then you can go deeper and more wide and offer it to anybody that comes to your site, has an opportunity to promote your stuff through an affiliate link, through a code, and you should have the abundance mentality, not scarcity. I want to pay more affiliates than I want to hoard money. 
because first of all, I'm a big manifestor. I'm a big believer in asking the universe and delivering, getting karma back. But if you're not, you know, if you're trying to be scarcity, like ah, I'm not going to pay them, they didn't really make the sale. You have to be very clear and transparent and honest in this business. And it's going to pay dividends over time, especially with partners, because there's a lot of mistrust when it comes to partnership programs, um, especially if it's like something new to you or your business. You know, it, it's funny that because some of my some of my clients, you know, um, they like getting the referral fee. I gladly pay them the referral fee <laughs> if if I can close high ticket sales in like half an hour in a half an hour call because they've already done all of the work. I will gladly give them a referral fee. That makes my life so much easier. But you know, it's funny. Some of my clients don't. Mm -hmm. They won't take it. I offer it to them. They won't take it. So, you know, I always try to find other ways um, to just say thank you. So one of my clients has referred several clients to me, will not take a cent. So I contacted him before Christmas and I said, listen, we're going to do your audio book for free. Because I just wanted to say thank you for all the ways that he has, you know, helped and supported and uh, the business, but those who, you know, say, Hey, Kim, I could really use the money. You know what? It, it's, it's worth it. And I, I like your approach that, you know, giving that money to affiliates, I think is just, I think it's just right. Like to me, it, it, when I can't return a kindness, it, it doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good value add. Like the nurturing of your partnerships is part of partnerships. It's not separate from mm -hmm. it. So even if you're paying commissions, however you're doing that today, um, nurturing that and showing recognition and, and adding value to someone's life beyond just a compensatory uh, effect, um, I think that's important. What I like to do is take out the guesswork of it. So there's some really so there's some really cool softwares that you could get into if you want, depending on like, you know, we, we'd audit the business as to where are you at? Do you want to just do this manually and pay out? Or do you want to make this automated and easy so that, you know, someone doesn't have to ask you for the commissions. You don't have to like wonder. It's just black and white. Here's your link. If they buy through the link, here's your payout. You're not even involved in it. You pay a small processing fee to the transaction person doing the referral for you, um, meaning the company. And like I said, I, I can make some recommendations. I'm not affiliated to any of them. And there's so many of them out there mm -hmm. that integrate with like Shopify or other background e-commerce platforms that make it easy. And that way the person can just go get a link, go get a code and then go promote it without even having to be like feeling, oh, I got to go ask Kim for money because I kind of want the money. Mm -hmm. It just takes out that uh, that awkwardness from it. And as you scale the business, um, you know, these people talk to other people. And so there's a lot of circles, as you're aware, like networks, you know, expand upon each other. So if I know of a great affiliate program for an affinity brand or affinity audience that I'm associated with, I'll recommend that affiliate program to them. Say, hey, you got to check out Kim's book. It's it's selling so many copies for me. You should check it out. I think your audience is perfect. So you automatically get this wildfire, wildfire networking effect. That's what I like to call it. It's when people are just like, you know, creating these wildfires for you of organic referrals because they know you've got a great program, it's easy to use, and you provide them a bunch of marketing material. So that's a, a kind of a deeper layer as to get into like the affiliate nuances is like, what are you offering them to promote? Yeah, links good. Comp compensation's good, but you need to then uh, do your homework. What's the best marketing piece? What's the best email? What's the best podcast ad read that you can give them and teach them along the way how effective it is to do this ad versus the one they're doing because it may be something you split tested or you've learned. So beyond just money, I like to bring affiliates and partners value in the form of knowledge and marketing knowledge, copywriting knowledge, and split test wins as well. We're going we're to dive a little deeper into that. <laughs> First, we're going to take a quick ad break. But just before we do that, um, I wanted to share with you, um, you probably noticed that we have gone to two episodes a week. So this is the first time we've gone to two episodes a week. Uh, we were doing three. And the, I just wanted to explain why we've cut back one episode a week. RTI Publishing is growing. We've been developing new programs, new products, new services. Um, 
I am back in school part time to study something that has been my dream. And with all of these things going on, I just really felt that I couldn't keep up with three episodes a week. I, I've been trying to, but I am getting a bit behind. And so audience, what I'd rather do is make sure that you got two continuous episodes a week, no breaks. Now I did reach my goal. My goal for 2023 was to do three episodes a week, every single week for 2023. And I reached that goal, but I feel that I need to scale back a little bit also, because I am now spending time on other people's podcasts, they are now requesting that I go on their podcasts to speak about these things that, you know, you guys get all the time on the Author to Authority podcast. So our episodes going forward will be on Tuesdays and Fridays. So twice a week, you are going to get the same quality, the same high level experts, just two times instead of three times a week. Now, you know, what time it is. We've got lots of resources at RTI Publishing. Here's one that's going to help you learn how to write a book that converts readers into clients and scales your business. We will be right back. Writing and publishing a book that converts readers into client and scales your business is hard, but it doesn't have to be. Get my free checklist at bit.ly forward slash create and scale that will show you what you need to do to have your book become a well-converting lead generating tool. Welcome back. Joey, I'm really enjoying this conversation, but I want to shift gears a little bit because most of our audience is, you know, professional speakers, coaches, uh, probably more solopreneurish. And they probably sell services as opposed to products. So how would you deal with that in terms of like affiliate partnerships and that? Because some of these things, when you're selling high ticket services, it's not necessarily a link that you can, you know, send out uh, and have it, have it automatically tracked and paid out. How would you deal with that kind of situation? Yeah, that's a great question. And, I really like to be challenged when it comes to throwing myself into a brand new audience, brand new environment and be like, okay, let's figure this one out. <laughs> because typically I'm working with supplement companies and direct to consumer uh, products, which is easy, right? It's a link on a site, people send traffic, but I think the fundamental principles still apply. So the first th step with any client that I work with is if you're a speaker, if you're an author, if you're a high ticket coach of some sort, you probably have a lead in. Lead in mean meaning if you're selling a five thousand dollar package, you're not going to potentially start with the five thousand dollar package. It might be something else that you can leverage at a lower ticket to funnel them into the higher purchase point through the journey. So through that purchase point, I want to identify what's the lowest hanging fruit and the lowest ticket item that could potentially become its own affiliate product. Or you're not necessarily having to sell anything as an affiliate in the beginning. It could be a lead capture you're paying for where instead of paying for a sale, you're just paying for somebody to opt into a webinar or to an email series that you're happily paying an affiliate X amount of dollars because you know that it equates to Y amount of dollars at the end of the funnel. So if that sounds complicated, then I'll try to kind of bring it down to a different level. It's, I wanna now find affiliates that could promote me and I wanna find out who my audience is. If you don't know your audience, then you have some work to do. But then where are my audience is hanging around and who are they attracted to beyond myself? I wouldn't look for direct competitors because then you're just going to be directly competing with them. I would look for affinity brands. Affinity brands are brands that are just a bit different than yours, not selling the same product or service or outcome, but have the same avatar, the same person with the desires of this benefit overall as a holistic approach. But I'll give an example. Um, as a supplement company, we work with a product that is a magnesium supplement. So I'm not going to go find influencers and affiliates that are promoting magnesium because that'd be a direct competition. You could go that route, but it's a lot harder and it's an uphill battle. Instead, I'm going to look for, well, who else is interested in magnesium? People who like sleep, people who uh, want more from their health, want to be better, you know, moms or dads for their kids. So it's health related people. So then what other products are being sold with that same audience? 
One of them that comes to mind for me was like blue light blocking glasses, which blocks blue light at night so you can get better sleep, uh, mattress companies. And so you kind of go down the line. And then what I would do from there is to start reaching out to these influencers, these affiliates that are already promoting. One, if they're promoting something, it means they understand the game and they're probably willing to take on more partnerships or sponsorships or affiliate deals. So then I would start to target them through that. And what I would lead them down the road of is you could position them where you could do an interview, as an example, an interview where you're on a podcast and then you sell a high ticket course. But the high ticket course takes such an amount of, <laughs> you know, sales to happen or like, you know, a sales strategist or a person on the other side of the phone. And if you had that set up, great, just go straight for the kill, straight for the sale. But instead, I would encourage them to be like, what's the freebie or the first step of that journey? And you can direct them there, similar to a podcast, you know, when we offer like, hey, go check this out at the end of the podcast or this in an email, go check this first part out. From there, you can build a relationship, given that you've got some sort of email autoresponder sequence or sales strategy after that first initial touch point. So that would be my strategy. But Kim, I might have missed any part of that you want to dig a little deeper into. So just let me know. I think one of the, the biggest things for me is, you know, how do you get to know these people first so that you feel comfortable asking them to be an affiliate for you? Mm, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a really good question because like, how do you reach somebody? You know, do you DM them? Do you, you know, uh, comment on things? There's no shortage of ways. I think that first and foremost, be genuine, be yourself, be authentic, lead with what you know, add value to them. So, as an example, if I wanted to get on maybe Kim's radar, <laughs> I might go and rate her podcast. I might take a screenshot of me rating the podcast. And it doesn't necessarily start with, hey, could you promote my stuff? It's a nurturing environment. And I like ethical relationships and, and sustainable relationships. So some people are, are cool. It's just like cold DMing people all day long. And it's a numbers game, just like a sales operator would operate at. I prefer leading with a relationship that I want to work with this person for a long time. So I like to nurture them. That's gifting, that's recognition, that's adding value. That's just saying, hey, I love what you're doing. Keep it up. And that's it. And then you strategically, though, I know I'm reaching out like two to three weeks. <laughs> so there is a strategy behind that. But I think adding value to somebody's life before asking is really powerful when it comes to relationships, not just with affiliates. I mean, this goes for everything we're doing in life. Um, and being, you know, very intentful with what we're doing with people rather than like what's in it for me. Um, so that's where I start. But again, all of this comes down to there's a system behind it. I know that if I'm going to be trying to contact somebody on my radar, I look at it as, okay, well, there's a three week nurturing period or however much time you assign to that, but make it a system. The beauty of systems and measuring and having KPIs and scorecards and tracking what gets tracked and measured gets improved. So if I'm doing the system for the better part of a month and it's having success, I might want to add more team members doing it. And then I measure success again. How does it work with other people doing it? Creating feedback loops and building a system of outreach. And this is what we're talking about, by the way. So in my approach, I've got four phases for partnerships. There's the architect and auditing. So where's your program at today? And let's architect a better one. And then phase two is outreaching, nurturing, and onboarding which is what kind of we're talking about today and being very strategic with that, having a plan, measuring it, and then optimizing. How is it working? Am I getting the outcome I expected? Yeah. yeah. You know, when you were talking about that, um, something I've been thinking about a lot, and it, it may seem a bit strange, but I think it applies. Um, there's a book, I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. The concept is, is that we all give and receive love, and there's five main ways we do it. And most of us have a predominant love language because it's, it's a form of communication and a secondary. And his premise of his book, and actually this, this revolutionized my husband's marriage because we couldn't figure out why, like we were both so unhappy. Um, we realized that we spoke opposite love languages. So he was doing things that, you know, he thought, was making me feel loved <laughs> and they weren't and, and, and vice versa. But I've been thinking about this lately in terms of, you know, you talked about nurturing and connecting. And when you look at 
you know, the love languages. So the first one is, you know, um, words of affirmation, uh, acts of service, quality time, gifts, and physical touch. So obviously, you know, in an online environment, physical touches out and, you know, that's just not appropriate anyway. So let's just take the four <laughs> of them. But I was thinking in terms, you know, of reaching out and nurturing, if, you know, during that nurture process, if you try different things, because if someone's love language is gifts and you give them something, right, that creates a bond. If if it's words of affirmation and you say something really nice to them, you know, quality time, maybe they just want to get on a, a Zoom call with you and talk, right? So I was thinking through that and how, you know, how do you implement that in terms of, you know, just getting to know people, building your network, um, like trust. I don't know if that's something you've ever thought of. I, I would just love to hear your thoughts on it. <clears throat> well, first off, the five love languages has been uh, a must read. So anybody in a relationship needs to read this book, even with your kids, understanding how to develop a relationship with your kid and reach them because some people like gifts. Some people like uh, words of affirmation. And so this th did revolutionize my relationships too with my wife. <laughs> um, but for partnerships, I've never really thought about it that way. I think it's a great way to look at it though. And what you're really referring to is like, there might be five different methods that you can reach this person. And my approach would be try all five of them. And you might not like, so you could do some research, you know, <laughs> I mean, it might be some AI that can figure this out about people just looking at their profiles and like things like that in advance, which if you're into AI, you, know, you, you go down that rabbit hole. But I think I would lead with like, what's an easy low hanging fruit thing that you could do to add value, you know, words of affirmation. Again, if I commented on your podcast, rated it a five and said, love this show and legit listen to a few episodes. That's kind of like words of affirmation. And it's a, it's a bit of a gifting, but it's not a physical gift. Um, so I would try all five and see which one that person gravitates towards. And even on the call, they might be like, hey, I love the fact that you sent me this gift. Or I love the fact you hopped on a call with me. No one ever wants to just hop on a call anymore. So all of a sudden you identify, okay, this person's love language is this. And you make a little silent note to yourself. You put it into the notes for that person's relationship. And I, I literally have like spreadsheets where I track everything that I hear in an ongoing basis with conversations I have with people. Because I want to make a, a meaningful connection with them long term. This, this isn't like contrived stuff. It might sound like, oh, wow, Joey's got an agenda. It's not, though. Why is it bad to make a commitment to somebody to learn about them and to yeah. establish that relationship? So I would just say, try all five. Make notes on the ones that are working more. Maybe you realize gifting is the way to go. But ultimately, it could come down to an individual every single time. And next time, when you reach out to them, you know that, oh, I'm just going to send them a gift because they love gifts. Like They don't really care what I have to say about them. <laughs> they don't want to get on the phone. But man, they love getting gifts from me. Yeah, and you know, uh, back when I was in network marketing, I tracked conversations I had with customers because I was usually only talking maybe three times a year. Or I'd be talking to three to four times a year. I'd be talking to each customer. And so uh, on their order forms, the most current order form, I'd write down some things that we had talked about. So maybe I was talking to someone and they had shared with me that their cat was sick. You know, because you just get talking. I, I always just had, I always talked to my customers. I took time to be a part of their life. So I would track that. And then the next time I called, I would say, you know, hey, you know, last time we were talking, you know, you were telling me your cat Snooky was sick. I was just wondering, how's your cat doing, right? But those little things made all the difference because then they felt like I cared about them. And I wasn't doing it to be manipulative. I actually did care. But, you know, when you've got three, four, five hundred 500 customers, you're not going to remember all that stuff in your brain. Like, I, I got enough going on. I can't remember all that. So, you know, by writing it down, for me, that was a way of showing them that I cared. 100%. And the hack with that is, you know, I have my EA load in um preset templates in the meeting if i know i'm meeting with kim and she likes talking about cats and podcasts that'll be my agenda notes i'm like okay I, and you know again um i like i like to prioritize relationships because we only have so much time 
right? Like you mentioned. Yes. So who's like your 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 wolf pack, your your five people that would be there to help you change a tire in the middle of the night? <laughs> and then like, you know, who's your your friends and family, but like your top 25, your top 100, your top 500, top 1,000. When you get in the thousands, it's like your fans, your raving fans of people you're not in direct contact with. So I think that like, you know, you're not sending gifts to thousands of customers all the time unless that's your business. Um, I just think that understanding what level of commitment are you going to make to these partners based on the value they're bringing you, either in relationship, impact, or direct value. Um, so that's just a little side note on the whole relationship and nurturing and how much time to spend with them. Love it. Love it. And and you are right. You can't spend time with everybody. Um, so, you know, finding those people that, you know, you have them. I think I like the word synergy, you know, people that you have the synergy with. We're not going to have time actually today to talk <laughs> about your story, Joey, because this has just been such a good conversation. We'll, we'll have to have you back another time to share more about your story. But I want to make sure that I ask you the question that I ask every non-author that comes on the show. So are you ready, Joey? I am ready. Okay. If you were to write a book to build your business, what would you write about? I'm not writing a book yet, but I've got like six ideas. So I might need to talk to you about how to refine that down at some point. <laughs> but I think for me, if I, if I think of myself in 10 years from now, <clears throat> beyond helping people with subject matter on partnership marketing, influencer marketing, affiliate marketing, um, I really want to help people escape apathetic thinking and uh, un un unleash limiting beliefs, like switching to empowering beliefs and helping them make that next change in their life. So really something on kind of overcoming that journey of I can't to I can and taking next steps, feeling the fear and doing it anyway, which is a whole different book, which is a great book, great read. Um, that's where I really want to write a book. I just haven't solidified the structures and, and uh, the audience yet, but I know that deep down, if I could impact five people's lives or 10 people's lives to like escape what I referred to as a corporate cubicle cage, that's what I was in. I hated Sunday nights and I dreaded Monday mornings. I want to see somebody make a shift from that, no matter what the environment and no matter what they're doing next. I think that would be a really amazing book. Thank you. Oh. Okay. So, you know, you, you talked about, you know, escaping apathetic beliefs. And I think even sometimes, you know, in business, I think as, as entrepreneurs, we have sometimes these belief systems that just really stop us from being the, the best person that we can be and the best entrepreneur we can be. 100%. Um, I've went down many rabbit holes on this, uh, on this path, thinking every time that I would be quote unquote fixed. The idea of being fixed is is far-sighted uh, or it, it's short-sighted or it's just not a reality so i think i mean mindset is the biggest thing no matter what you're doing the next step in anything is leveling up mindset and one example that i'm going through right now uh just through you know circumstances is that i can't figure out the how anymore in this certain situation in my business where i need to scale to the next level so i'm like thinking i need to work harder i need to work longer and i just need to sacrifice more and I worked with my mindset coach and he's like, well, how does that feel? I said, it feels terrible. <laughs> I, I hate that feeling. And he's like, well, then why don't we change that? Why do you have to work hard? And it's like, well, because that's what I know. And he's like, well, have there been times where it's been easy? So then I started thinking, I'm like, well, there's been this time, this time, this time. That was really easy. And he's like, how does that make you feel? I'm like, really good. So, okay. So the empowering belief is maybe in order to be successful, I have to work less and I work from a relaxed state. That's your new belief. Find evidence as to support that new belief. And that one little exercise every single day has been transforming the way I think. And by transforming that limiting belief into an empowering belief, which isn't my methodology, by the way, is now shaping the new how. The how's unveiling itself to me just through shaping my mind to actually believe it's possible. So we always get it in the reverse. Um, so that's what I've been practicing and been disciplined at for like the last three weeks where I kind of fell off the wagon for the past year. <laughs> you know, the one thing I realized um is i know a lot of what i even know a lot of how but what i realized is i can't see the forest for the trees so one thing i did last year 
is I actually found some specialists in the different areas that I wanted to grow in and paid to work with them. And it was an amazing experience because I didn't have to figure out how. I just had to follow them in where they were leading me. And they could see the trees. Yeah. And so the process became quicker. It was a lot less stressful. It took the pressure off of me to create something that was amazing. And I came out of it with a whole lot more clarity than I thought possible. So maybe mindset plays, but maybe you just need to find somebody who can help you do the how. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's a great book called uh, The Who, Not the How. And what you're referring to is like the who to provide the how. <laughs> you don't have to figure out the how. You can hire people to help you figure it out. And that's one of the biggest hacks there is, is like continuously finding coaches to level you up in ways that you couldn't help yourself in. Um, and the one thing I'll mention too, if anybody's interested in partnership programs and we didn't have enough time to get into all the nitty gritty on it, you can email me or find me at partnerupprofits.com just to do like an audit of your program. Like I'm passionate about talking about this. So I would just happily give a consult on things and where you're at and where your business is going and if partnerships actually has a good play or not and how it would fit in. So just to throw that out there. Love it, Joey. So we got time for one final thought from you. One final thought. <laughs> okay. Um, so my final thought, these are like some sayings that I keep with me. And again, I'm a big mindset, even I'm a mindset guy as well as a strategist, but no matter what situation you're in, I think it's giving yourself permission to think about change. Um, as well as one quote that resonates with me a lot, which is keep your gratitude higher than your expectations and you'll have really good days. Mm. Gratitude, man, that's an underutilized tool in today's <laughs> society. If we could just look at things through the eyes of gratitude instead of competition, I think our world would be a much, much, much better place. Joey, thank you so much for being on the show today. I have very much enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it, Kim. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Audience, where do you go to next? Well, if you are watching on YouTube, you're going to click the thumbnail somewhere here on the screen because I'm never sure where my daughter puts it and there's several choices. Uh, you're going to go to episode 468, How to Supercharge Your Business. If you're on your favorite podcast app, you are going to be scanning back about 30 episodes to find it, but it's another great episode on ways to grow your business. If you have wondered about partnerships, here's my best word of advice. Start making them because they're definitely worth it. So thank you so much for listening today and we will see you on the very next episode. Have a great day, everyone. Bye now.